Hello and welcome to episode two of Chatterbox. My name is Callum and I'm an associate artist at Playbox Theatre, the company who created Chatterbox. For those of you new to Chatterbox, this is an ongoing series of conversations with actors and artists from across the industry and we've got some big names for you. Next week we'll be chatting to the star of Sex Education, Amy Lou Wood. After that, we've got Olivia-nominated writer Laura Wade. And the week after that, it's the turn of the Shadow Culture Secretary, herself a former actor, MP Tracy Braben. Last week, we chatted to the star of 1917, George Mackay. If you missed it, fear not. You can catch up for free at youtube.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. Now, before we meet today's guest, a super quick reminder that, as always, we want you to get involved in these conversations too. So if you're one of the lucky young people with me now in this Zoom interview, get those questions coming in. All you have to do is hover your mouse on the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top of your screen on a mobile, and you'll find a button you can click to send questions directly into my inbox. Importantly, you're going to be able to see the questions other people have asked, and you can vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. The more votes, the higher they will appear in my inbox. And as always, we will try to get through as many as we can. Now, if you're watching live on Facebook, hello. Though you can't message in questions, we still want to hear from you. So send us your reactions, your comments, your feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook. We don't mind which. Now it's time to introduce my special guest this week. Chopé de Rissou needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Chopé studied economics at the University of Birmingham before, in 2012, playing the title role in Pericles at the Royal Shakespeare Company. From there, he joined the National Youth Theatre's Rep Company, an eight-month programme of training and performance. And since then, he's worked extensively in film and television, including Black Mirror, Gangs of London and The Huntsman Winter's War. He received an Ian Charleston commendation for his performance as Coriolanus in Coriolanus at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He's worked at the Donmar Warehouse and was most recently seen on stage in the West End transfer of Death of a Salesman. Let's take a look at him in action in this teaser for Gangs of London on Sky One, a warning that there are some spoilers and a few violent images. Let's take a look. I'm really excited for people to meet Chope because I feel like we landed on our feet with him. He's a rock star already in the making. We gave him things within this show that we had absolutely no right expecting him to achieve and do. We could do that punch, we can get pushed into that wall. He's all great. I'm probably going to be the founder of his fan club after this. My father was taken from us on the streets of London. Whoever killed my husband remains an enemy to this family. I have the entire city looking for his killer. I'm not interested in peace. I am so thrilled to welcome our second guest to, for series two of Chatterbox, the incredibly talented Chope Dirisu. Chope, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you holding Hi, up? everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really oh, glad to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you. How are you holding up in isolation, Chope? Yeah, I mean, ups and downs has been hard, as I'm sure it has been for everybody, but um, I'm surrounded by my family, so I'm really grateful for that. That's fantastic. How lovely. Now, look, our first question comes from last week's guest, George Mackay. Mm -hmm. He says, hello, Chopin. Hope you're going well. <laughs> um, it's funny because I know George, so this is... So <laughs> <laughs> he said you did a radio play together. Yeah, we have. We have. Yeah. Um, he, so his question is, if you weren't doing this job as an actor, what would you be doing instead? Was there something you nearly did? And if there was, how does that play into how you are an actor? Well, I suppose um, the most straightforward answer to that question is that I did an economics degree and all of my friends from my course are working in various different parts of the finance sector. They're either working in banks or they're working in consultancy. So it's not 
impossible to imagine myself in that situation. That said, I think if I wasn't an actor, I would want to have done something with languages. I've always loved speaking different languages since I was younger and I did really well with them at school. So that would have definitely been something I would have pursued. And I suppose to the second part of that question, how does it affect me as an actor? Um, when it comes to languages, so the character of Elliot in Gangs of London mm. has a backstory that uh, he and his father traveled a lot through Europe when he, when he was younger. So for me, I take a lot of pleasure in pronouncing like a lot of European names or places correctly as they would have been pronounced in their own native languages. Okay. So that's something that, that's how I would use my, my fascination with languages. And in terms of my economics, <laughs> I don't think I use that as much at all. There was a play that was on, written by Lucy Preble many years ago called Enron, which, in which she discusses the financial crisis and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. I've got an economics degree and I want to be an actor. So maybe I'll be an Enron one day. But um, so far that hasn't happened. <laughs> Not yet. Not well, yet. It's, it's interesting that you say you you did economics at, at Birmingham University. Mm. That's not the most traditional route into the acting world. No, I guess not. <laughs> most people probably go to drama school um, or have been doing it as a child beforehand. But yeah, I, uh, I took the scenic route. <laughs> well, as something I hear a lot is parents asking children to kind of get a proper degree in inverted mm-hmm. commas before pursuing acting. I wondered, was that a consideration for you? Yeah, short, short answer to that is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that I understand exactly why. Um, my parents were first generation immigrants from Nigeria coming to the UK. And whenever a person moves from a country that's not their own, there's a, se- there's a period of instability, you know. Um, and I think that is always made easier adapting to a new culture or settling in a new country if you've got a professional job, you know? Mm. And I think they wanted a lot more certainty and stability for their children. And I'm not just speaking for my parents when I say this, but the universal immigrant experience. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that your education is the best that it can be in something that will definitely be useful going forward. Um, they always made the distinction between art and science as, for example, when you're doing a maths exam, there is a right answer to that equation and you have to show you're working, but it's right or it's wrong. Whereas with an English essay, it sort of depends on if the examiner understands your perspective yeah. uh, or if you use the words in the right way or, or depending, especially in acting, if they like you, sometimes if they like your face, you know, <laughs> you might get better marks for that. Uh, so the subjectivity of the art is not something that is, can often be relied on. And I think that a lot of parents, and especially immigrant parents, are looking for as much stability as possible for their children in this new country, new society, you know. And so they, have they been supportive of your choice? One of the reasons I was able to feel confident to pursue a career in acting is because of my mum. I remember halfway through my degree at uni, um, it really dawned on me that I wasn't enjoying it. And that I was kind of scared that sitting in an office doing reports on child labour in third world countries was going to be the rest of my life. And my mum could see that. And in the Easter holidays, she took me to, us, to the side in the kitchen one time. and She was just like, what's wrong? Why aren't you as happy as I know you can be? And I told her, and she was the one that said, then you have to try. Then you have to do the best you can do, uh, take all the opportunities that you can, and see how far you get. Because if you don't try, you'll always have that monkey in your shoulders, like, ah, but what if, what if? And and so with my mum's blessing, I was able to start on the path that's led me to where I am now and my dad is equally as supportive especially when the work is coming in because you know that it's not always coming in (laughs) there are fallow seasons and seasons of plenty Um, but they're definitely proud of how far I've come for sure. And so you went from uh, economics to the Royal Shakespeare Company Mm -hmm. and 
Pericles in Pericles. I mean, that's a pretty incredible sort of step to have made. How, how, yeah, how did that come about? So I was really blessed, if I'm honest. I was <laughs> in the right place at the right time. Um, the Royal Shakespeare Company were running a program called The Open Stages. And what they were looking for was an experiment. It was a theatrical experiment as to whether or not with the same resources and the same attention to detail, an amateur company could put on a production of a show to the same quality or standard as a professional company could. Now, I think the answer to that is obviously no, because there's a certain level of training or experience or quality that makes an actor at the top of their game what they are. But the, what the RSC was looking to prove was to see if that pure love of what you were doing and that abandon into the worlds that you wanted to create could be found in amateur companies. And the answer to that is unequivocally yes. Uh, so they looked for actors who were based in the West Midlands. And this is why it was a real blessing for me because I was at university in Birmingham, just up the road from Stratford-on-Avon. So I technically qualified and it was in my last year of uni. So if I didn't apply the week that I had, I would technically have re relocated to my London postcode and therefore not qualified anymore. Gosh. So um, I applied just in time. Um, and I went through an audition process with the casting department up there. And yeah, I was really fortunate and lucky and blessed to be given the opportunity to play such a great role on such a great stage. I mean, that was the heavens shining down on you in that moment, wasn't Most it? Most definitely, yeah. <laughs> and, and Pericles, I mean, that play is nuts, isn't it? I mean, even for Shakespeare, it's pretty, yeah. uh, there's a riddle about an incestuous relationship, there's a shipwreck, a jousting contest. I think somebody yeah. drowns and then comes back to life, was it? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it feels like seven series of a TV show that have all just been crammed into three hours <laughs> rather than giving the space to breathe at every juncture. But um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's not performed as much as the others. It's just a bit too crazy or what, uh, a ride to go on. Um, and how, how, it was uh, super fun to do. At 21, how did you find, how easily did you connect with that material, especially as it's 500 years old as well? You know what, I think, as I spoke earlier about the sort of love of it and the passion and the reckless abandonment to creating worlds that you have as someone who loves performing, I think I tapped into that a lot more than I did. Okay. Um, the, the full weight of the journey of the character. I think if I was to play Pericles now, it'd be a much different performance to what I did then. And then if I was to play Pericles in another 10 years, like you understand all the stages of his characters because he goes from a 20 year old man to a 55 year old man over the course of the play. Mm. And aging up using makeup was really fun, but I think there's a certain amount of life experience that I lacked playing the role at the time. And maybe it'd be something that'd be cool to revisit at a later date. Um, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so you, I guess you'd mostly sort of learned on the job, but, but you did do eight months with the National Youth Theatre's rep company, mm -hmm. which is kind of an in, their intensive training program. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Was that sort of a kind of stomping ground for you? Well, I'd been a member of the National Youth Theatre, the whole body of it, since 2006, I think. So I'd been a member for seven years when I joined the rep company in 2013. And I can definitely attribute my entire time at the National Youth Theatre as given me the experience and grounding and foundation of the skills that I've gone on to develop professionally. And I definitely wouldn't be where I am now without that, the time I spent there. I think my time at the rep company was like the cherry on a cake that had been cooking for seven years, you know? And at the end of that, they were able to present something that they had completely crafted from the age of 15 to 22, you know? And like, here is our product of seven years work <laughs> to the industry. What do you think? And, um, and I suppose the rest is history. But I made some of my best friends from the time I spent, not only at the whole National Youth Theatre, but specifically on that course. And we still check in with each other today. And I think sometimes what you get from a training or a period of time is not always the skill. Sometimes it's the exposure. And a lot of the times it's the relationships that you build. And I think that was definitely true for my time at Rep. 
And then fast forward a couple of years and you're on, you know, massive Hollywood sets with Chris Hemsworth <laughs> and Charlize Theron. Yeah. Was that a daunting thing to do? Most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I remember getting the job and being a little bit starstruck <laughs> before I even met them, you know, just to know that these are the people I was going to be working with. And I remember watching Thor for the first time in the cinema when I was at university and thinking that Chris Hemsworth was one of the most beautiful men in the world. Um, I was, I, I definitely had a man crush on him then. So to be working with him and I had to like quash all of these feelings so I could be as professional as possible. But um, I also remember stepping onto the soundstage at Shepperton Studios and seeing that they built this entire inside of a castle. And I had stepped through the wardrobe uh, into Narnia, you know, um, to be working on theatrical stages at, in school plays and at the NYT, you know, where we do the best we can with what we have. And you create that world in your mind to literally being transported physically I felt like oh Chopin is now in a castle on a snowy mountain somewhere in a fantasy world um it, yeah that that feeling of grandeur is something that I'll never forget but also <laughs> meeting Chris for the first time was incredible because he is as beautiful in real life as he is on screen <laughs> and he's so charming and he's also just really really lovely I remember obviously there were lots of children extras, um, supporting artists that were working on the set. And he was world famous for playing Thor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So all of them would be like, Thor, 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 Thor. <laughs> and he took it in his stride. He gave each and every one of those children time to like, you know, he just gave them the attention that they really wanted from him. And he was really magnanimous about it all. He was never like, oh, can we get the kids away? And, and I really respect him for that. And yeah, he made my experience, my first experience with a massive Hollywood production really, really easy. And a lot of them did actually, and I'm really grateful for the relationships I made on that as well. And how, how do you find working on projects like that? I mean, in my sort of very limited experience, you know, whatever size role you have in a play, you're kind of part mm -hmm. of a company and you're together every day for months. But for screen work, the company can often feel like, you know, the crew, the camera operator, the grips, mm -hmm. the people who are there, whatever you're shooting. I wondered as an actor when, you know, you kind of drop in and out on a film set. I wondered if as a consequence, you feel like your personal process changes between stage and screen. Well, when you say personal process, the first thing that comes to my mind is in terms of like how you are building your character or how you're performing. And I think that more than anything else, it's really important to keep that constant and to keep your grounding in what is your own craft the same and not allow that to be influenced by the, the job you're doing on or the size of your work because you want your, the quality of your work to be consistent and at a high standard as often as possible mm. because whether it is one person who's seeing you in the theatre once or something that's going to remain for the rest of human existence in, in film and television um, you want to give a really good account of yourself and you want to do the best that you can at all times but I it would be a fallacy for me to say that your day-to-day -day workings are not different on a massive film set to a small budget short to the West End or pub theatre, you know? There are things outside of yourself that you can't change, but keeping yourself as constant as possible, I think, is a really good piece of advice. And what was the process like on Death of a Salesman? Because... You stepped into that show, didn't you? you mm -hmm. When it transferred, you took over a role. Mm -hmm. Had you seen the production before? before yeah. yeah, I had. Um, I had friends in the production at the Young Vic already, so I definitely went to go support them. And I'm a big fan of Wendell Pierce as well, and Sharon D. Clark. Um, Arinze is my friend. Uh, Martins is my friend. So I was always going to see the show. Okay. And it was a piece of art that I just really, really connected with um, in terms of like the pressures of expectation that are sometimes put on children and also like how difficult it is to A, get by in the world as a human, but then also as a black man in that production, that specific struggle was highlighted. 
Mm. Uh, and when I was offered the opportunity to be a part of the story and be a part of that conversation, um, I leapt it. it I, I, I was desperate to be in it. And I was really blessed that that opportunity did come my way. And was it as creative as other um, pro- process, other plays you've worked on? Or was there an element of having to kind of play catch up to the production? What was really great about the way that Marianne Elliott works was that she did not hem me into Arinze's performance. There were some things about the whole production that were going to say the same, like singing in certain moments or physical action in certain moments, but we rebuilt the play from the ground up when we we rehearsed it because the space itself changed. The Mm. set was a lot wider at the Young Vic than it was uh, on the West End. So a lot of different things had to be configured, not just where a certain actor was going to stand at a certain period of time. So she was really great, and as was Miranda Cromwell, because they co-directed it together, at giving us the freedom to, for me to play my Biff as opposed to just step into Arinze's shoes. And they really appreciated that we brought different aspects of this character. Um, and their celebration of that difference really gave us the confidence to continue to perform in the way that we knew how rather than felt like we were acting by numbers somebody else's performance sure I mean I saw it and I I absolutely loved it it was I mean you were so fantastic in it but the whole production was excellent and it it really cracked open this play that I I mean I'd seen it before and I'd studied it at school Mm -hmm. and just for anyone who who might not have seen or read it uh, Death of a Salesman is about an aging salesman Willie Loman and I guess his loss of identity and his, his inability to accept um, changes that are happening within himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, an, an early draft of the play was called In His Head, I think. Is mm-hmm. that right? Yeah. And there was definitely a kind of fantasy element to the production that you were in. I thought, you know, Willie's made up stories about himself and his children seem mm-hmm. to kind of ring true to the curated lives we present on social media. And even though it was set in the, the, the 1940s, the fact that the Lomans in this production were cast as an African-American family surrounded by white Americans made it feel, com- I mean, it would be completely the right play for now. I-, I wondered if those contemporary resonances were things you were discussing in rehearsals. Yes, I think, especially with the way this production was, as you said, with an African-American family at the centre of it, the conversation did become a lot more about not just the working class struggle, but the African-American struggle in America. And a lot of people want to separate America and Britain uh, in the conversation as how race works. But the struggles that Winnie Loman went through um, in our production are very similar to struggles that my parents went through when they first came to this country and are not too dissimilar to a lot of the struggles that uh, black families are going through in the UK today. So it was definitely super resonant and very prescient. And it's very unfortunate that as recently as a month ago, it became even more, um, even more an active topic of discussion. And you were also so physical in that production as well you know you're pulling all these kind of american football poses which for me kind of Mm -hmm. represents your father's mind sort of disintegrating um but then i sort of look back at your body of work and so much of it has had a physical element to it Mm -hmm. and when we heard the creator of gangs of london talking at the start there about you know throwing you around in fight scenes and uh and i think for humans where you played a a, a synth kind of human robot (laughs) Was there a kind of like synth school, was there? Where you had to kind of learn how to yeah. walk and move like yeah, a synth? Yeah, there was. There was. Um, with Dan O'Neill from, uh, he'd done a lot of work. He was a dancer for many years and um, worked a lot with Frantic Assembly, which is a movement theatre company that some people may know of. But um, I suppose going back to Biff, that was really special for me because I played American football at university. So all of those motions and movements were something that I was able to bring to the character as someone who has an experience of playing the sport. But yeah, I suppose when I was still at school, there was this big conflict between 
sporting extracurricular work and creative extracurricular work. And sometimes it would be um, conflict of time as well. I would be wanting at training at the same days that I was wanting at rehearsal. So how were they going to split time with me? Um, and I suppose I've, another reason that I've been really blessed is that I've been able to merge the two in my professional work. So I did a bit of karate or judo when I was younger. So to be working now in a television series in which I'm using that physicality is a real wonderful unison of different aspects of my life. And then once again, with playing American football and playing the role of Biff, who was an American football star, uh, I really hope that I stay injury free, touch wood, and that I'm able to weave that physicality into a lot more of my career going forward. Because I do think that even if it's not playing a sport or fight scenes or action sequences, I think physicality is a really big and important way that we build and create characters. So I want that physical aspect, even if I'm just doing like radio voice work, I want that physical aspect to really be a part of my craft going forward. So do you, you, somebody who spends time thinking about the posture of somebody and how they move and where where Mm their centre of gravity is and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And I think that it's also really important to, because as soon as somebody sees you, even in real life, you are able to make a story about that person. Uh, everybody has presuppositions or presumptions. I think that's the <laughs> good version of that word. Um, and y- so much story is told just by the way somebody walks, how they carry themselves, how they're dressed, um, whether their hair is tied up or tied down, if their beard is long, you know. And I think that then when you open your mouth, another aspect of a story or another filter is put on so I think that I want to tell as much of a story as I can with as much of my body as I can even before I open my mouth um and your physicality or how large you are if you carry yourself as a big person or if you're a bit more shrunk in all the time like all of those considerations are super important and I do want to and try to, I may not always be successful, but if you, if it's a consideration in the back of your mind, you're more likely to act on it than if you never thought about it at all. You know? That's great. That's, that's wonderful advice for approaching a character. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, it's, it's probably time that we hear some of the many questions that are pinging away in my inbox. Okay. Um, we're going to kick off by getting somebody on screen to ask a question to you. Camera to oh, camera. Rich, our technical magician, is going to magic Ailey onto your screen. Now, Ailey is a wonderful member of Playbox. And over the last series of Chatterbox, she, she messaged in some fantastic questions. Yeah, I'm so pleased she can be on camera with us today. <laughs> Ailey, how are you doing? Hi, Ailey, you're right. Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good, thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, so my question is just quite a simple one, I think. Um, okay. I was just wondering what's the biggest thing you've learned from somebody else that's helped you in your career? Um, there is one piece of advice that I always come back to and I learned it from someone at National Youth Theatre right at the beginning of my journey. Um, on my course, there was an actor who's super successful now to this day called Matt Stoko, and he was like a big brother to me. And one of the things he said to me was that all you need to do is be nice and do good work. And I think that's, (laughs) I've never received more succinct or better advice than that. I think the relationships that you build, not only with people that you work with day to day or your friends, but also like casting directors or directors, like, or even runners or stage management, you can be, people will find out if you're not a good person very quickly and you wouldn't want to work with someone who wasn't kind to you or someone who didn't respect you. So creating the environment for everyone to do their best work is only going to be better for you and your production and, and <laughs> just being a good human being, you know. And then the do good work part of it, I think is similar to what Callum and I were talking about earlier about holding yourself to a high standard and making sure that you're consistent in the quality of your work. Because 
you don't want to ever look back on something and be like, oh, I didn't really try in that moment or feel exposed or vulnerable. Um, and also, if you love doing something, you always want to do it to the best of your ability. And then somebody else told me that we work in an industry in which there are many different reasons why you might get a job. Um, and we're always very lucky to get the job or we work super hard. And there are people that work really hard as well that don't get the same opportunities that we do. So one way of looking at it, and I don't always subscribe to this, but one way of looking at it is that you owe it to everybody else who didn't get that role to make sure that you do that role to the best of your ability. But I think more than that, you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the people that you're working with to make sure that you're doing your best and enabling them to do their best. So all of that long spiel condenses down into be nice and do good work. Um, and I think that's a mantra that I'll carry with me for the rest of my career. That's great. Does that answer your question, Ailey? Yeah, I think that's a really lovely way to look at it. Yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. mindset to have. Right. Yeah, you can take that with you back to Playbox. Yeah, <laughs> good people and good work. <laughs> Thanks so much for your question, Ailey. Thank you. Love uh, to meet you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, before we do some, um, some more Q&A, we, we launched a little poll earlier today on our, mm -hmm. our Instagram takeover, and we gave everyone the chance to pitch a question to you to answer. Okay. We picked our favourite two, we held a vote, and the question people would like to know the answer to, with 82% of the vote. Wow. What has been the hardest scene for you to film? Goodness. Oh, okay. I did a film in Germany uh, a couple of years ago and it hasn't come out yet because they're still, I think they want to do a couple of reshoots. But in one of the scenes, oh, it gives me shivers just thinking about it now. Um, I play an astronaut uh, who crash lands into Earth and lands in the ocean. And so the pod springs a leak and it's flushing full of water. So we went to a massive swimming pool in Northwest Germany where they train the Coast Guard and they train people in the Navy to work in submarines and stuff. And what they did was they had this pod, this version of our pod, submerged and then flipped around. So I was upside down underwater and then they took the breathing apparatus off me and the water flooded into my nose and just filled my sinuses. And it was unbearable it was it, it was <laughs> it's the most i've suffered <laughs> unwillingly in life so far but i tried my best to struggle through it so that we could get that scene and the bubbles were all flying in the right direction because he was supposed to be panicking and panicking and what was really hard was that another character swims into the pod and gives my character something to breathe with but because of the budget of the film we were shooting that didn't actually work. It wasn't something that I could then breathe into in the middle of the scene. I just had to pretend that I was like calming down with this, <laughs> this thing full of water and I couldn't breathe. And, and I tried my, my best to sort of calm myself. And I knew that there were safety measures around. If I was really struggling, I could ask for help. But that is definitely the hardest scene I've ever had to film. Yeah, for sure. That sounds and that like film hasn't come out yet, so it'll be interesting when it does come out, if everyone who is in this chat sees it and is like, oh, that's the scene he was talking about. There's <laughs> genuine panic in that face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no acting required there. That's great. At Millie Neighbour, thank you so much for that question. So let's take it across to the Q&A inbox and see what we've got here for you. We've got loads. Okay. Um, Straight off the bat, here we go. Ed would like to know, uh, what do you find is the first thing that you should do when approaching a new role? Read the script. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also read the script and read the script and read the script. Oh. Hello? Sorry? Hello. We lost you for a second there. But you're yeah, back. I'm so sorry. Um, my phone is connected to my iPad. So I'm just going to go and put that on mute so that doesn't happen again. But um, <laughs> you want to read the script and read the script and read the script so that you know unequivocally. Oh. Have we lost Chopin there? 
maybe we have lost Chope. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, whilst we wait to get him back, we will show you a little Q&A from uh, the NME that Chope did earlier this year. Oh no, oh, he's returning. We were always going to have some technical issues at some point. Things of London about the process of working on that project. Hello. Oh, no. <laughs> he's back. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> what a lava. <laughs> that, is, that is okay. We were just about to go to some pre-record of you chatting about Gangs of London, but you're but you're back, so that's okay. Yeah. So sorry about that. Um, uh, still answering that question. Yeah, read the script. So you know the world that your character is inhabiting, and you know your character's tendencies. Um, there is something that we were taught uh, at National Youth Theatre, and I'm sure there's lots of drama schools and lots of youth theatre companies as well. Is that you want to make a list? about your character, facts and questions. You want to list all the things that people say about your character, which may not all be true, but it's interesting to know how other people feel about them and why. You want to make a list of all the things that your character says about themselves, um, which may not all be true, but you want to separate the facts and know why your character says so-and-so about themselves and then you want to make a list of all the things that your character says about other people and in the first list what people say about your character and the last list what your character says about other people you understand their relationships and I think as is true of real, real life your relationships make up a lot of who you are and with those three lists you've got lots of information and then research questions as to how you're going to go on to build the rest of your character and that's stuff that the script gives you for free or things to question that the skip gives you for free. And then you can go into, oh, my character was a soldier and a war veteran. Did they have any wounds that affect their physicality? Or how does that affect their voice that they were screaming over gunfire? Like, what is that? You know, all of those different things. So start most definitely with a script and you can never be wrong. That's great. That kind of links into a question here from Danai. Mm -hmm. who says, um, what do you do to prepare for an audition? Which, would you do all of that work pre-audition or is that something you do once you've landed a role? Well, sometimes when you're just auditioning for a role, they won't give you the whole script, especially in um, screen work. Um, sometimes, most times in plays, the play may already be published, so you'd be able to do that work. And sometimes they tell you that you're coming in tomorrow for the audition, so you don't always have the time to do it. But I would always want to do as much work as I could with the time and material that I was given. But if I can't do that, it's just really good to make a choice. Just say, with the information that I have, this is something that feels right to me. Um, but if you can do that amount of work, it's really good practice. And the more that you do it, the easier it is to do later when you do get the role. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to tell you that I sit down and make all those lists and all those questions for a role that I haven't got yet. <laughs> <'Cause>, um, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. It is a lot of work. And I suppose you just do as much as you can or as much as feels right to you. Fantastic. Um, Bhavan would like to know, and this, is, this question has had loads of votes. Mm -hmm. um, she, she asks, do you believe there will be a legitimate desire to change within the industry following Black Lives Matter or do you think it's simply a case of people playing lip service? Mm. Um, it is a concern that a lot of global majority and specifically black artists have because the thing about social media is that it can make you feel like the world is changing and then a week later, there's a new thing that everybody's jumped on. But this is something that black people and people of color will live for the rest of their lives. Not Hopefully not the, the level of institutional racism, but the fact that we are black. You know, that's not something that we can change week on week. 
and we it, we need safety in the workplace. We need safety in life. I do genuinely think that, and I don't know what it was, but I do genuinely think that something is changing this time. A lot more people and important people are listening and acting on it. A lot of CEOs of various different businesses and different industries are making impactful, important, and like change that will happen now that will influence what's going on in the future. And I've had conversations with people in the industry, including agents and casting directors and directors, about how people are making institutional changes and that these discussions are happening. Even something as simple as um, diversity, inclusion, and bias training, people are signing up for it because they know it's important. And I really hope that this will have long-lasting effects on the industry going forward. Like, there was something really important that happened recently with Central School of Speech and Drama, where they sat down with some former students and held their hands up and said that we have been institutionally racist. They've released a statement on their website that you can all go and read right now to say that we have failed and we're going to do better. Um, so, to be fair, I have to be optimistic because the the other the uh, the flip side of that is um, it's one of those ones where if you don't laugh, you don't cry. You'll cry. Mm. So. I am maintaining optimism and I want to share that optimism with people. But then I also want to make sure that I am a part of this change. I can't just leave it for other people to do and let them pay lip service. I think we all have to consistently hold those people to account and say that this is what you said you were going to do. You haven't done it. And what is the repercussion of that? And I think Central have started to say that this is what we're going to do and this is when we're going to do it and this is who is going to do it. And that level of accountability published um, will, A, make sure that they make the change that they say, and B, hopefully set a precedent for what a lot of other institutions in our industry are going to start doing. But unfortunately, it's one of those things that time will tell because it's not going to change overnight. So hopefully we'll look back this time next year and be like, okay, it has changed and it is going to continue to change. I, th I think, as you say, what Central have done feels like a really significant step and to have taken. Um, so let's hope that is it starts a ripple. Yeah, but they didn't get there without a really massive push from their own alumni and current students. So, like I said, we can't rely on the gatekeepers to change, even because of the massive amount of momentum that's going on around. We need to continue to hold these people to account and we'll see what happens. Great. Um, look, Caitlin has um, a question of a different tone. She yep. said, um, this is a bit of a throwback, but okay. I was wondering if you remembered a little about what it was like to act as a synth in humans and what the process was like in terms of learning to move and behave like your character in such a natural way. Mm. Um, I suppose preparation is super key in all roles because you don't want to be on stage or be on camera thinking like, oh no, um, I'm supposed to move my head first and the, or my eyes first because you everyone will see that panic, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that panic will be printed in that TV program for the rest of eternity. Um, so you want to, if you're adopting a physicality, practice it as much as possible to the point where it becomes second nature. And when you're in front of camera, it's not something that you're thinking about. It's something that's in your body. So um, we were all enrolled in, as you mentioned before, a synth school where we worked with Dan and the directors to create a physical language for these robots. And we discussed where technology was now and where it would be in a parallel tomorrow or a future tomorrow. And one of the things we discussed was the efficiency of movement. So all of this like gesticulating that I'm doing now is a very human trait. A robot wouldn't do that because it would trust that the words that are coming out of its mouth were enough to communicate rather than needing to feel like I'm this action of unburdening myself. <laughs> and simple things like the way my eyebrows move when I'm speaking and that, that face that I make, a robot wouldn't do that because it doesn't need to. So you strip back all of those things 
and remembering to breathe, but only because it makes humans feel safe. <laughs> Things like that. One of the one of the disciplines I had to learn was that if the eye is a receptor and taking information and it wants to take information off to my right, then the eye will move first before the head moves, you know? And it was little things like that, that really were, okay, now you're a synth. Because we, you just move, you just move, but a synth would move its eyes first before its head, stuff like that. And, so, and also like body posture, like synths don't sh- slouch because they're all like metal and... S- mm-hmm. So I, I, I can sort of just turn it on now because I can feel that synth in me still because of how much preparation and practice we did. Um, and so I do like to freak my mum out with it sometimes. She's like, oh, okay, you're being a synth now, aren't you? Um, and so were you having to kind of like pick every gesture that you were going to make and sort of drill it until it became second nature? So you'll notice that in this, it's not, you're not doing the robot, you're not like, or doing all of that. There is a fluidity to it. So I think that, especially with the, the Elster synths who were a bit more human than most other synths were, there was a bit more freedom that came with their movement, but it was still really efficient because they were a bit more human than the rest of the synths were. So, and they'd grown up, they'd learned from an environment that was a lot more oh, human. I can't escape that word. <laughs> um, so there were, there was a lot more freedom that we had that other actors didn't. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed that process, which is why I think it stays with me so much. That's great. Um, Paulina asks... Mm-hmm. Uh, do you find any similarities between your role in Coriolanus and Elliot in Gangs of London? She says, brackets, saw Coriolanus at the Barbican and you were brilliant. Oh, thank you so much for coming to see it. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Like, I tend not to draw parallels between characters unless they're really stark because I can see in a lot of careers that sometimes actors become pigeonholed into playing the same role over and over again in different guises. And it's something that I'd love to try and avoid. So when I'm building a character, even if there are similarities, I just discover them in the process of building that character rather than, oh, I remember what this was like, so I'm going to bring that into this. So it's a question that I have to sit and analyse. But I think that both characters are quite headstrong in that Cory Davis thinks he's always right. (laughs) But also Elliot is willing to charge into those situations that are perhaps quite perilous or is willing to like bend the rules to suit what he needs to do and his sort of he relies a lot more on his own moral code rather than what maybe the done thing should be i think there's a similarity between the characters in that respect they're both very physical in terms of Coriolanus being a soldier and Elliot being an ex-soldier, a police officer and a fighter, clearly. Um, But, yeah, I find it difficult to draw more parallels than that. I'm sure there are a couple, and I'm sure if (laughs) if you listened to me, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, that too as well. But um, off the top of my head, those are the two that I can think of. Well, here's one that's um, slightly more on the business side of uh, acting. Lottie asks... How do you create connections when beginning in the film and TV industry? One thing that I learned recently that was revolutionary and really important is that it is really important to meet directors and casting directors and agents and people who can employ you. But it is equally as important to build relationships laterally as well as vertically. And when I say laterally, I mean building relationships with your peers, people who are at the same level as you. Because in 20 years' time, those are going to be the decision makers, people who are directors and casting directors. And I'm not telling you to wait 20 years until your career starts, but (laughs) those relationships will be equally as important as the ones you have upwards. And there seems to be, and there was was this dependency on work coming down to you 
coming through the channels or being gifted this. Whereas there needs to be and has started to be definitely this um, activism and making our own work and making our own work with our friends or with people who are at the same level as us. So I've got a friend who's a director. So I've got a friend of, who's a writer. Maybe you could write something that you could direct that I could be in. And someone who wants to be a cameraman could film it, you know, and then we'll just see what this thing looks like now and hope that when we make another thing in four years time, that it'll be better than that. And we'll have that relationship. And then you end up with, you know, Scorsese working with Pacino and De Niro all the time <laughs> because they all came up at the same time, you know, making films together. Um, but it is also super important to make relationships with uh, directors and that. And how to do that? It's a really good question. It sort of depends on your personality. Um, people do read emails. People do read letters. Um, people enjoy it when you go and see work that they've created, especially in theatre. Um, it's a really good question because I'm naturally not a super outgoing person. So I'm not going to go and go to someone's office un uninvited or turn up at a press night and hope to shake their hand. But uh, by osmosis and being in those places, it started to happen. So I'm not sure exactly what the correct answer to that is. But so it's kind of a nebulous one, isn't it? And um, yeah. I guess depend, you're saying depends on what feels right to you mm -hmm. as, as an individual, whether that is, whether you're somebody who wants to go and turn up at a press night or write a letter or somebody who mm -hmm. wants to, you know, wait for those things to come to them. Yeah. And inviting people to see your work does work. Sometimes people will turn up if they are able to. But um, yeah, there are many different ways to skin a cat, as the frame says, as the saying goes. But um, I'm not sure which one, which method will work best for you. Cool. This will probably have to be our last question, I think. This is from Gigi. Um, now, earlier on, we heard the best piece of advice that you have been given. But Gigi asks, what advice would you give to a young actor? Particularly one, she says, interested in the film industry. Okay. Um, I'm very tempted to pass on the same piece of advice <laughs> that I received because I think it is so excellent. Um, I suppose it falls under the good work section of it. But I think it is to be prepared. And I, I, every time I say that, I think of Scar singing it in The Lion King in my head. <laughs> um, but it is like you never know when your opportunity is going to come. And someone said that luck is um, good timing mixed with good preparation, you know, mm. and that if your opportunity comes and you're not ready for it, it will pass you by because there's somebody else who that opportunity could go to. And I suppose it just means like work as hard as you can, especially because you love it. And if you don't love it, then it, it is so grueling and tests you so much. And it's so, um, it's thankless sometimes. And there are ups and there are downs and it really, so, like, you owe it to yourself to work really hard when those opportunities come and to work really hard when there aren't opportunities as well, you know? We all have, uh, what do you call it, good intentions of, like, reading plays together and, like, making work together. But I tell you what, one of my favourite theatrical experiences was reading, I think it was Two Noble Kinsmen, it was either that or Two Gentlemen Verona. I can't remember which one because they're so similar. <laughs> um, but we were sat around a dining table in a man who I didn't know at the time, but I'd just been invited through my then girlfriend. And we were just reading this play. That's all it was. We were just reading this play together. And it came to life. And it was just something that we were doing as friends sat around the table. And that's an example of putting in the work when the camera's not watching. Um, 
I think that's great. I think that's such a yeah. lovely note to, to end on. Yeah. Um, oh, well, look, that just about concludes episode two of Chatterbox. But before we wrap up, Chopin, mm-hmm. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to share your lockdown list with us, something we could, that can keep us creatively stimulated in isolation. Okay. Um, watch more documentaries. Watching films and watching TV series are great and you learn what you like and what you don't like. But learning about the world is so interesting as well. And I was reading a book earlier today. I was reading Natives by a Color, And he mentioned an incident that happened to him in Brazil. And that just unlocked something for me. I now have a short film that I want to write based on an experience that he had that's slightly different. And it plays the structure. So you can find creativity in the strangest of places. So watch more documentaries and what do some more like non-fiction work as well. Because not only will you find inspiration from the strangest of places, but also you just learn a lot more about the world that we're trying to reflect in the art that we're making. That is great. Um, now, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. Join me the mm-hmm. same time next week when I'll be talking to one of the stars of Netflix's smash hit coming-of-age comedy, Sex Education, the one and only Amy Lou Wood. Mm-hmm. Now, in the spirit of keeping the creative conversation going to week to week, Shopee, I think you've got a question for Amy, is that right? Okay, my question for Amy is, is the attention that's come from the success that she's had what she thought it would be? And how is she managing it? That is a great question. That's really great. Well, tune in to see how Amy answers that one. And if you've enjoyed today's episode and want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theatre where you'll find interviews with BAFTA, Olivier, Emmy-nominated actor Juliette Stevenson, multi-award winning Hamlet, Papa Esiedu, and creators of The Goes Wrong Show, Charlie Russell and Dave Hearn. And don't forget, we'd love to hear what you think. So send us your thoughts, reactions, feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on whatever social media channels you like to use. And before we wrap up, just a quick reminder that Playbox Theatre, the youth theatre who've created Chatterbox, are in the middle of a £50,000 fundraising appeal that is absolutely critical to their survival. And I, I know Playbox is not alone in having a tough time at the moment, but if you can, they could really use your support. So please, if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to support the company who make it, head over to justgiving.com forward slash playbox dash theatre. Full details will appear on your screen at the end of the episode. And if you can't donate, don't sweat. Just find someone you know and like and tell them about Chatterbox instead. Um, all that leaves me to do is to say a final thank you to Shopee Dirisu. Thank you for joining us today, Shopee. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all our Chatterbox partners up and down the country streaming this now. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you to all of you for watching. Until next Friday, stay creative and see you soon. Goodbye.